It's time for Gardening Inside Out, a live show offering you plant advice for any space in your life. Introducing your perennial hosts, David Bates and Josh Carey. Hey, welcome in everybody to the Green Room Studios here at uh, Bates Nursery and Garden Center. The hollow that surrounds the nursery looks beautiful this morning with the with the fog and the mist around it. But we're inside. We are inside the studio, and we're and trying hear, to trying to share to somewhere. social media that we're going to go out there and do this program. But uh, we're here every Saturday morning from. Uh, from from eight to nine Central Time. Yeah, it's up uh, the the low ha- low hanging clouds this morning, Josh. Yeah, beautiful uh, out there. It's we we had a uh, pretty good uh, little splash of precipitation in the mm-hmm. overnight hours. Well, we'll just look at that quickly. Mm-hmm. Um, so over here, the, the this is the uh, the official Bates Nursery weather station. Eighty four uh-huh. hundreds overnight. So uh, <sighs> pretty good little shower, and we've got more on the way in the coming days. But not today and not tomorrow. Today, of course, is Saturday, the 6th of January. Happy mm-hmm. New Year for one final time. Yes, Happy New Year to you too, sir. Put that out there. Mm-hmm. Uh, 47, 37. We're going to have cloudy conditions throughout the day, today and tomorrow. Just a little cooler, 44, 29 as the clouds roll out of the way on Sunday evening. Monday, 53, 44 and mostly cloudy conditions. And then we get rain again, uh-uh. beginning on Monday evening, uh, maybe eight tenths of an inch, uh, as it currently reads on uh, Monday evening, four tenths on Tuesday morning early. So, you know, maybe an inch and a quarter possibly during that little stretch. Uh, Wednesday, Thursday hmm. looks pretty nice: forty-five, thirty-five, fifty-four, thirty-eight, and uh, you, uh, a fair measure of clouds, perhaps some more rain. By Friday of next week, uh, and then you know you never know. There's a there's always that lingering you know. And ten days out, there's always that's snow that showers word this time up there? of year. Or, yeah, they're forecast. Uh-huh. Doesn't mean anything. No, it's just a forecast. So uh, you look at here at the radar quickly and see the uh, here's the Middle Tennessee area. The the rain has gotten out yeah. in the way, so we are beyond that. And uh, currently, it is 40 degrees here at Bates Nursery Station, live from the green room at Bates Nursery and Garden Center. So Absolutely. Absolutely. Glad to be here today and uh, have everyone on board. Everybody. Who to... else is everybody, David? Well, well we've right. got Caroline Gant. Right off there. Lowen. Good morning, guys. Hey. Good morning. Good morning. And, we, uh, and across the way there, the guy who makes us all... Uh, possible makes everything possible to the tyler, tyler cam good morning tyler, tyler cam yeah morning you look clean this maybe morning, tyler, tyler, tyler may change his last name to cam <laughs> so we can just call him tyler, tyler cam tyler, tyler, tyler cam, cam. Yeah. come from a long line uh, of cams you know for for winter time um activities there's really quite a lot of interest in gardening you know we were talking Absolutely. before we went on the air caroline that there is no shortage of questions, but before we get into that, of course, we're all busily uh, preparing for springtime, which will mm-hmm. be here before you know it. So um, what are the things that are on your mind this morning before we dive into these uh, backlog of questions we've got? Oh, pottery. Mm. Pottery. So much pottery. pottery. We unpacked how many pallets? At least 24 in the last I think three days. Like yeah, three days of solid Heavy lifted <laughs> pottery work. <clears throat> Caroline has to use her brain and go in and check everything and scan everything and not sticker scan everything, sticker everything. You were close. It was an S word. So and then we <laughs> we me Ben uh, Owen, Owen John, John Mac Lauren Mac, Lauren all of them have been very helpful with moving it getting it around. We've had probably the most efficient pottery put up that I think we've ever really had. Yeah, it's been a great team this year. Mm-hmm. Well, it's a kind of hard. It's a it's the kind of activity that you you don't want to duplicate motions. You want to try no. to get it mm-hmm. in the right spot the first time. So I know Caroline has really uh, had her thoughts focused on that, so My that brain hurts. it gets <laughs> positioned correctly right off the get go. Yes, we want to make sure we sticker it 
and then we put it where it, where it goes, li- lives forever. Time. Tyler, did you get a picture of all the pottery yesterday? I got a video. <gasps> video? Oh, wow. Yes. Are we able to throw it on up there? I believe so. It's Let's some it. gorgeous pottery. So this was Pottery oh, no. Market. We got oh. 41 pallets, a whole oh, semi no. and a half. Here we go. Are y'all ready? Yes. Anticipation. Getting it's ready. Uh, it's a little choppy. Hey. Oh, okay. It's <laughs> choppy in a fun way. It's like it's dancing. Choppy. But look at those. Those pots are Ooh. giant. They're uh-huh. huge. Uh, containers and all the pottery that we have is that when you get more stock in, then you have more complementary pieces to match up with the things that you had. From Absolutely. The, the, you're probably, we can block Austin yeah. off there. Yeah. I don't, I don't you became pottery. You've been doing so much pottery. You became some. I'm He's turned sore. into it. Oh, I'm sore. But good pottery is a great investment. I have some pieces out in my landscape. I love a good, um, cool-looking giant pot with like some sort of specimen in it, or using it for annuals. Mm-hmm. But having something really large amongst your landscaping, it looks so good. And I mean, some of these pots are like five hundred dollars, but really, in the long run, it's totally worth it. Those are going to last maybe forever, forever yeah. as long as you know you don't run into them with a riding lawnmower or something mm-hmm. and yeah. take it out. You know, I've got two pots on my front porch that I've had for years now, and I got them from Bates because one of my family members got me a $100 gift card. No, it was like one of those Visa gift cards or whatever, and I decided to use it for two really nice pots. Whoa, we are really on me. <laughs> yeah. so close. Good morning, Austin. Uh-huh. Get out of my face, face man. Haven't shaved in a minute. Uh, but anyway, yeah, I bought those like five years ago. It was $100. I spent like 180 on two pots and still on my front porch today. They like to joke and they they call them, what do you, you call them? Turquoise. Turquoise. That's, They're a, turquoise. that's an Anora reference who uh-huh. worked here a hey, while Nora. back. Good yeah, morning, but Nora. two beautiful pots still on my front porch that I decorate every single spring and fall. So love them. It is a good investment. They don't go bad. Speaking of uh, pots on porches, uh-huh. my mixed planters that I made this fall, we yes. put the pictures up, look stunning right now. The oh, snapdragons, yeah. they're not blooming, but the leaves look great. The foliage looks fantastic. That uh, rainbow ascot euphorbia that I put in there, mm-hmm. I'll bring a picture next week. I mean, nothing looks sad right now in either pot. So I'm really excited to see how it does as we move into um you know, February, where it's going to get a lot colder. Yeah, the premium mm-hmm. pansies are popping in the, at the Proving Grounds, I'm mm-hmm. telling you. Gorgeous this year. Yeah, yeah pansies are doing great really right now. Are. One of my favorite gardening things to do is a big, nice mixed container. Mm-hmm. It, when you're done with it, there's just, it, it's so good. I had a guest yesterday come back and show me a picture of hers that I did for her. This was about two weeks ago. And she has like kind of a shady front porch-ish. Mm-hmm. And it was it, we, we i helped her get a mix going we got a nice flow in the pot oh that was a gorgeous pot yesterday. you sent me a picture because uh-huh. it was working and i was like wow yeah and she came back yesterday and showed me a picture of it and she was like i am in love with this i walk in every day and i see it and i just love it and you I'm had like that's great cast iron cast iron plant hellebore and being hucra, up tall right? and awesome wow. Heucra in the middle mm-hmm. with that red foliage and then a hellebore right out in front that was blooming a similar color to the heucra it really worked it i was proud of it and she was happy with it, so it cool. Was a gorgeous planter. It was. Guys, we better get to uh, we better get to the questions. We better get to that, the questions. The, the Facebook page them. is on fire on uh, the gardening inside out. Caroline is monitoring the Bates page. We've got the YouTube monitored. So if you got a question, we got a bunch of them already in this week, but we need to get to them. We let's do it. <laughs> let's do it. So let's start with some winter questions. Okay. We got quite a few questions on planting stuff in the winter here. Uh, first question: Thoughts on when to start cool season seeds in a cold frame? And uh, not quite yet. Um, yeah, I mean, you can do it now. That's the great thing about seeds is they'll just sit dormant with the cold weather. So if mm-hmm. you really wanted to get out and you're itching to do something, like it's not a bad idea to go ahead and sow some seed. They're just not going to germinate quite yet. Uh, they will germinate whenever the weather is right. So honestly, doing it now, you can keep it controlled in a cold frame. You're not going to have wind right. and rain and all that type of stuff that's on top of seeds that could move them where you don't want them. So if you can keep them in a controlled spot in your cold frame, I mean, if you like I said, if you're ready to do it, do it. You don't necessarily have to do it yet. But when the weather warms up and that cold frame heats up like it's going to with the sunshine in the, you know, probably late February into March, you'll start to see warmer temps and you might see some germination. So that's a fun little project to do. I mean, if we're not doing anything else at the moment, not too much. Yeah, there's not a lot going on. Mm -mm. How about good veggies for Nashville winter? It is a little bit late, I think, to do veggies, but... 
Um, one or of the early. cold hardiest. Or early, yeah. Yeah, or early. I mean, there's a lot of herbs that are okay and, and, like, you know, evergreen herbs that will stay up through our winter here. When it comes to veggies, not so many minus, like, you know, kale is a very cold, hardy vegetable. I right? had one grow for three years and mm-hmm. never died back. It was a tree. Yeah, like the they're almost perennial it. here, and they pretty much are. I went to a buddy's house the other day who's really gotten into gardening, and I stopped by to look at his garden plot that he's got. And the by far the best looking thing in his garden was his kale. kale. Uh huh. And it was up and big, and he's still munching on it. Wow. You so, know, my my brother Mark has a cold frame he's built over his little garden spot, and he turned some incandescent light bulbs on on really cold nights. He still has lettuce. Yeah, lettuce. Along. He's he picking uh-huh. lettuce. Throughout the winter, so long as it doesn't get severely cold, and fortunately, to this point, you know, we haven't really had anything that's all that severe. Yeah, no, but right. so far, my rosemary is doing good. I've still mm-hmm. got some cilantro. I've got sage. I mean, yeah. they, but, I've got all that. Yeah. yeah. Hey, great point with the cilantro right there, Josh. Yeah. That's that's a hard one for us to grow in the summertime because it bolts so bad and oh, it, it wants to go to seed great. and it flowers. But growing that is a cool season. Herb is the way to do it. Mm-hmm. So, I remember somebody here saying that they grew snow peas, I believe, or mm-hmm. sugar snap peas. But also to get to get them to flower, they, they had to start them really early, like in January. Yeah, I start mine pretty, well, not that early, but... Or February. I or love something. growing them so much. All right, how about bulbs? We got like three or four questions about, is it too late to plant bulbs here? You know, tulips, daffodils, mm-hmm. all those spring bloomers. No, I don't think it's too late to do that. The problem is finding those bulbs right. or getting them, you know, and, and that's going to be the tricky thing. I know we're... We're, we're just about out. We're of about out of them. Uh-huh. Yeah. So, I mean, most people have beat you, to, beat you to it is the problem with that. Now, if you want to like mail order some bulbs or something to you, I'd say you better start getting on it and getting them in the dirt. So, I mean, most of the bulbs like David talks about are usually pre-chilled. So they'll still come up and, and set leaves and then flower um, after that. So I don't see anything wrong with, with doing that. Is there a that, freshness but. date or a label on them like there is the- for grass seed? I don't think so. Really? Yeah, and you know the worst thing that'll happen <laughs> is that they flower a bit later. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, and if you've already bought the bulbs, you just didn't get around to planting right. them. Of course, it's a really good time to go ahead and do that. Mm-hmm. Yep. Go ahead and do it. All right. And our last winter uh, seed and bulb question mm-hmm. is: Can I winter sow native perennial seeds? Yes. We <laughs> talked about that a little bit last week about how I let my um, kind of wildflower garden bed just go to seed in the winter and then I'll sow some more. So yeah, you can absolutely do it now. You just have to watch them being washed out um, if we get a big rain. Yeah, and you just made a good point. Just think about nature. What do perennials do? They flower, they set seed, mm-hmm. they hold on to that seed until they dry up <laughs> enough, and then they fall off of that plant, or birds take them elsewhere, or something happens, and then they germinate in the spring. So um, you can control that a little bit better by, by putting them where you want them and trying to keep them there, but we want to try to mimic nature as much as possible, and that's when the perennials set their seed, is typically during this time, is whenever mm-hmm. they're laying on the ground and getting cool and getting moist and ready to pop when the weather turns. Yeah, one nice thing. It certainly makes life a lot easier when you work with what nature has in mind as opposed to working against it. Exactly. Correct. Mm -hmm. And also leaving my seeds up for uh, the wildlife, for the birds. They come in and they help scatter them a little bit. They eat a bunch of them so it's not overly seeded. So Mm -hmm. nature does its own little work. Mm -hmm. So we had a viewer that received some hellebore for Christmas. Um, They say, I received beautiful hellebore for Christmas. Will it be too warm indoors? Yes, yep. <laughs> would be what I would say. Well, they don't want to be indoors. I mean, it's a extremely it's a cold, hardy, evergreen perennial. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, that, you just talked about how you put it in some mix planters, mm-hmm. some winter mix planters. So yeah, and I did that in mind because it is an evergreen, and then mm-hmm. heuchera is pretty much an evergreen if it's protected. In this specific spot, this woman had it was up underneath her covered front porch, so it was not going to be getting hit with frost and freeze and all that. So I thought we're going to put that heuchera in there too because it's mostly evergreen, and the cast iron plant in the back that's certainly evergreen mm-hmm. um, that'll stay. Yeah, but hellebore, I don't see any reason why you would want to bring it in your home. I mean, it's it's time to get that in the garden bed. Find your spot where you want it and just plant it. They're not looking really pretty right now. I mean, it's we're a little early, but I mean... I'm, yeah, my yeah. leaves look great right oh, now yeah. that I have in-ground. Yeah, um, the leaves but are But there's good. no blooms. Yeah. yeah, there's not quite blooms yet. Yeah. In our greenhouse now, you will come out here and see hellebore in okay. pretty much full bloom. Wow. Mm-hmm. Now, those have been forced in a greenhouse, and they're, you know, they're, they're a little bit tricked into being... They've been fooled. They've been fooled <laughs> to bloom. 
Um, but like you said, Josh, out in around town, they're not blooming quite yet. But right. they will be soon. They're the first one of the first yeah, they, perennials to bloom. They do not waste any time getting on with the flowering, and, and it is true that well, we don't really force them. We just have them indoors, and with the little bit of protection that that affords them, they they are naturally going to be a, a bit more advanced to whatever might be outside and mm -hmm. certainly getting them. Mm -hmm. They're very uh, adept at dealing with cold conditions. So it, it doesn't mean that if you put them out, if you planted those now that you, you might need to cover them uh, if we had cold weather coming up, but if it's only down into the twenties for low temperatures, probably not. Yeah, yeah, no. And that's a really great tough. idea about putting them in a container, Austin. I mean, mm -hmm. It really is. So Yeah. I mean, I'm okay with it. The only thing that the problem is is that they just f do their thing so early. They finish so early uh -huh. that for the rest of the year, you just have leaves. I love the leaves on them, though. They're okay. They're okay. I mean, okay. I mean they're great. You know, <laughs> you know me and just leaves. Yes. <clears throat> I want to know see you and leaves. You love flower power is your... Um, Motto. You know, your motto. Well, yeah. <laughs> Josh was uh, commenting before the show how green the studio was, and I had yeah. to remind mm -hmm. him, this is winter. Yep. We don't have a lot of flowers right now. <laughs> right. Okay. Well, we, we've been in is. this, you know, it's been cold this week, extremely cold. We wanted to bring the, the jungle feel into here. We you did, did bring the jungle feel. We made feel. the jungle room. Mm -hmm. We That's went with a, a thing, lot of right? basic house plants today, which we'll go over a little bit later. Mm -hmm. Um because I'm very curious about what's behind you. Isn't mm -hmm. it cool? You oh, probably yeah. need to take one home today, Josh. Mm. Uh, yeah, that's um, pretty big. <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh, my goodness. Hey, we've got a uh, from Colin. He says, uh, wow, I've come back after two weeks and y'all went for it. Looks amazing. Excellent work, but I have a small quibble. Uh-oh. Uh -oh. Call. Oh, oh, no. Call. You put Tyler in the corner. <laughs> Tyler. Nobody put, put Tyler baby in the corner. In the I corner. put Tyler in the corner. Oh, okay. Tyler put Tyler in the corner. But the Tyler Thanks, cam Colin. is so great. Yeah. Yeah, I actually have it now. Uh -huh. You know, my yeah. mother, Colin, said a similar thing. She said she kind of liked to, to see Tyler in the, in the frame doing his thing as we were talking about our thing. So yeah. I get it. I like to see Tyler, too. I'm right here. Yeah. There he is. There he is. The Tyler cam. That was a quick tire cam. It was. We Thanks, have lots Colin. Of, we have lots of questions. <laughs> we do have lots of questions. <laughs> Speaking of hellebores, Pam Eldridge on the Bates page said hers are beautiful right now. Yep. So sounds like she likes her leaves. She likes him leaves. Just like me. Well, that's okay. Well, mine They're going to be the, more beautiful soon. Yeah, mine aren't oh, in the gosh, best yeah. spot because they get a little bit more sun than they probably should. So that's why I was thinking about, oh, I think I'm going to put some in one of the new pots that I got so, mm -hmm. and bring them around so we can keep them a little bit more shaded. Yeah. yeah. I'm curious to see what my daughter's hellebore plantation looks like. So um, mm. maybe we'll see that this weekend. It's we also a, a good idea to go in and, and cl clean up any right. like nasty leaf that came from last year. So get it back clean with nice clean foliage. Okay. And then in that early spring, when you see that, that flower, you also see a flush of, of growth. Mm -hmm. So that flush will be very, very clean. So get rid of any leaves that have like black. A lot of times hellebore can go like black spotty. That's what I'm saying. Uh -huh. yeah. so. get, go ahead and clean that up. Get rid of it. I'm done with it. Done with it. Uh -huh. New year, new leaves. Oh. New year, new yes. leaves. Wow, oh, yeah. I love that. Mm. All right, we got a question <laughs> on the Bates page. When is the best time to plant new trees, specifically evergreens? 30. <laughs> 3.30. Yeah, 3.30. There it is. Yeah. Josh is yeah. looking at his watch. What time is it, Josh? Uh, it's not 3.30 yet. Uh -huh. <laughs> really, any tree, y'all, this is a great time to do it. Avoid the dead of the summer. We talk about it all the time. Dead of the summer is a horrible time to plant trees. It's hard on you. It's hard on the plant. But this time of year, it's great. A yep. good, adequate rainfall, typically. It's my favorite time to plant. Yeah, uh -huh. if, you anything. Come, if you come well, out to anything. the nursery this morning, I noticed it coming in because we were. I was looking around because I love the the view that we have across the uh, right in front of the garden center. There, it's a great time to see what the a lot of your foundation plants are going to look like this time of year. Great point. Okay. They got a winter look too. Yeah, you get your winter look as well as the other thing that's going on with it, and and, and they're and glorious. They're, and the and the conifers particularly yep. accentuate that really yep. well as far as, you know, the the, uh, the winter color that many of them take mm -hmm. on uh, is, is really the dramatic show that you get as far as winter color goes. So it's easy to, uh, you know, we all miss flowers this time oh, of yeah. year, but we, we don't like for color if you do a little planning on the front end and prepare to have some things in the landscape to kind of take up the slack color wise as you go into the winter season. Hey, speaking of winter season, okay. 
You may think that winter season means, Josh, that what? you you don't <laughs> plant this time of year, and oh, that's gosh. not true. Absolutely. It's not true at all. Matter of fact, if you want to have not just reasonable results, but excellent results, planting right now with Earth Mix Garden products is the way to make that happen. And uh, for many years now, Earth Mix Garden products has uh, been bringing you the very finest growing mediums, soils, amendments, uh, that are available anywhere, and they're they're manufactured and uh, developed right here in Nashville, Tennessee. They are done with the explicit means of, or the ex- explicit intent of giving you the highest performing uh, articles for your soil. That's going to give your plants the best opportunity to grow. We want your plant. We don't want you to have to work so hard yeah. to have really good success. And if you give plants the right things, such as organic-based soils, and our soils are 100% organic, all the Earth Mix line is. There are no chemical additives to any of them. Uh, only thing that's added is Indo and Ecto Mycorrhiza fungi and oh. humic acid uh, to those naturally fertile soils and the inputs that go into it. Uh, are derived a variety of different products. Supernatural is kind of the uh, the base of many other products, as is the standalone product. Earthmix Garden is the most widely used. Earthmix Landscape uh, certainly is one of our uh, best selling products in that it is the one that is really good for anything you're going to plant, be it perennials or trees or shrubs, or whatever. And it's also a great container mix on its own. And, of course, uh, with all of the uh, foliage you see here around the studio this morning, uh, Proganics Eye will be the choice that Caroline will recommend. The great thing about Proganics Eye is that there is no peat whatsoever in uh-huh. that. That means you get no fungus gnats, and you don't have all that to deal with when you're working in the greenhouse. And, uh, you know, they just are bothersome. So uh, where do you find Earth Mix? Well, you go up to earthmix.net, click on the Find Earthmix tab, and you'll see a map come up of all locations around uh, from uh, con- throughout Kentucky and Tennessee into northern Alabama. Uh, you can either put your address in the box here, or you can zoom in to a location for uh, turn-by-turn directions for a, for a location near you, and they are all over the uh, all over the area. So check out. Uh, not only the locations that have it, but the products that they typically carry. Just remember this, success in gardening begins at the ground level when you use EarthMix garden products. And the we best appreciate input. you giving us. Yeah, the best input Let's, for the best output. That's right. Let's keep inputting okay. these questions. Yes. Let's do it. We got to go. We got to go. Josh, did you have some over there? Uh, yeah, Risha is asking. She has several healthy large clumps of cat mitt and assume that they might lose their foliage when things get cold, but they haven't. Mm-hmm. They need to be pruned. Can I just cut them back to a smaller size now or should I wait till spring? No, you can go ahead and do it now if you want. But I will say, Rish, that's pretty cool. I mean, if yeah. you've already got your cat mitt and it's still up and it looks clean and good, then I don't see any real reason to get rid of it. Mine yet. is still my walker's low is still up really high and doesn't look fantastic up top. It still does have some leaves, but there's a lot of really healthy, perfectly looking new growth down at the base yeah. of the plant, uh, right at the soil line. So I'm about to cut mine back mm-hmm. probably this week. Yeah, I, yeah. I mean that's a great point. And and if your foliage is leggy and up there and not looking all that great or whatever, like Caroline said, all that new flush is going to come from the base of that plant and it is going to be clean and green in the spring. It's going to look great. So at any point over the winter time, when you're ready to get rid of those old stems, go ahead and get rid of them. Let that new stuff come up in the spring and let it be beautiful. Mm, I love it. Mine grows over my sidewalk. Oh, wow. Catman's amazing. I, I mean, think that's that actually Rish's birthday. <gasps> too, hey, birthday. birthday. Happy birthday, yep. Rish. <laughs> Glad you're tuning in. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Good morning. All right. What's the best time of year to plant ferns outside? I tend to plant mine in the spring, but I'm sure now would be great. I mean, it depends. There's a num- there, Most ferns are not um, evergreen. There are a few that are. Mm-hmm. So if you do come out to the nursery, you'll see a lot of ferns that are just cut back in basically a pot of dirt and roots. Um, so you can certainly... Autumn ferns are nice, though. Autumn ferns are great. They're already up, and they look good and stay up through the wintertime. So that's a nice one to plant. So if you want to do it now, certainly 
t- you know the time to do it. The great thing about the early spring is that you've got the cream of the crop best selection to look at. So I mean, if you really want to see what the foliage is going to look like, then wait till the spring until we start getting those first few shipments of perennials in, and you can actually see the texture of the leaf, the color of the leaf, all of that, um, and then that's a good time to plant it. Wonderful. Don't quit joking around. We're not Tyler. No. We, I sent Tyler a picture and I was seeing if he could get it up on the screen and he mm-hmm. was letting me know. I thought he was just saying I love you from across the studio. <laughs> I was drawing a square, not a heart. I was like, oh, <clears throat> well, we can go ahead and throw that picture up. So we no, can... not yet. No? no? That's not what the uh, thumbs up meant? We'll I'm... circle back. No, right. yes. we'll I meant I got your message and I'm getting it up. Okay. <laughs> Let's talk about pruning. Someone is asking, is it too early to prune fish? Fig trees. I know David knows all about fig trees. You have that giant one. Mm-hmm. You know, I wouldn't yet. Uh, it's it's a bit early. Matter of fact, it still remains to be seen whether you need to prune it all. Mm-hmm. If you have a mild winter like we have had to this point, so far, you know, my my figs at my house uh, are still green all the way out to the tips. Now, what that means, and there's green buds mm-hmm. that are up there, which that wow. means is that they're going to flower really early. And you can have a double crop of figs, and those early ones, Josh, are the ones that are really the most Good delicious, yes. and I mean the biggest, juiciest, nicest figs. So, uh, my suggestion is is wait and see. Don't cut. Uh, you know, last year, obviously, all the figs got cut to the ground. Yep. Mine were not the exception. However, uh, the shrub I've got at the side of my house, it. Uh, it's back to six feet by six feet. Wow. It, mm-hmm. it had hundreds of figs on it last year. Most of them, however, because it was all new growth, we didn't get very many that actually made it to ripening, maybe only 50 or 60, where with it, we typically get many hundreds. So mm-hmm. if we could have a mild winter, uh, we will have many. That means I have some to share, Josh. Is yours a uh, Chicago Hardy? No. Mine is a... King Arthur. King Arthur, right. My uh, my friend uh, Malcolm Mims out mm-hmm. of, uh, not Malcolm Mims, Oscar Mims. <laughs> Oscar. Different Mims. Oh, hey, Miriam. Oscar <laughs> Mims out of North Georgia. <laughs> Mal- Malcolm's a friend too, but he's mm-hmm. a different Mims. Uh, uh, Oscar Mims uh, gave that to me, uh, I'm going to guess it's been a decade ago. Right. And it was one of the more uh, winter hardy types out of North Georgia. And it's proven to be exceptionally good. Uh, not not just a, a very vigorous, very winter hardy, but also a, a, a wonderful fruit producer. Yep. So, you know, I highly recommend that one. We just don't get it in very much, nor do we have uh, very many of them. But there are many mm-hmm. good cultivars of figs on the market. So just After check out. We, yeah. We'll have a lot to choose from. I agree. It wasn't a great year for production last year because it was weird the way they came in. I they barely got yeah. any that actually ripened. Because yeah. they, they pulled in late and then they were just running up and then they would, you, you get 10 or 12 at a time. You know, it's a hardly even point time well, to get out and, there and, and make Again, it. that's indicative of right. you know, the freeze back right. and them having to come out from completely new wood as yep. opposed to being able to take advantage of the uh, buds that came out on the previous year's wood. And when mm-hmm. they get killed back, there is no previous year's wood. It's all got to regenerate out of the ground. Mm-hmm. Great point. So, yep. You don't want to prune a fig at all. No pruning. No pruning a fig. Nope. nope. Mine comes David. back from the ground every single year, but I live mm-hmm. uh, pretty far north of Nashville. You got a brown turkey? Because mine does 10. Chicago to hardy is oh, what okay. I have. Sounds like it'd be real hardy for that, but mine's not. All right, can you clut? Can you clut? Can you clear cut spirea? Yes, I don't necessarily know why you'd need to. Typically, I go with it when people ask me to how to prune spirea. I say ball it back up. Okay, so a spirea will get kind of up and a little bit leggy, like big wild hair. Like like wild hair. You're right. It is very thin stems, like hair. Um, I typically just say shorten and ball it up. Okay, so. Get to where all of the stems are really tight together, and then make all your cuts the same spot above, a, you know, a top of the earth. Um, but I would, I would not do that on Van Hooty Spirea, which is the <laughs> bridal wreath van. That's the one That's that the flowers one. really early. If mm-hmm. you do that right now, you're cutting off almost all of your flowers for the spring. So leave that one until after it flowers. Now most of your uh, other shorter shrubby types. Mm-hmm. The, the flowers are really not all that. It's mostly about good-looking foliage. Mm-hmm. You do get some flowers on, so it's much less so, but the 
the Van Hootie or the Bridal Race Spirea, uh, wait, let them flower first because they do flower very early. Mm -hmm. And then you can, like uh, Austin said, you can ball them up or do whatever you need to do to get them back within bounds. And then they'll be, they, you really need, uh, as with them and for Scythia, cut them back after they flower pretty hard and then don't cut them anymore the rest of the year. That's what gives you those nice flowing arching growth habits that when you have flowers set, the flower buds set on there at this time of year, it really makes that tremendous show in the spring. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that question is from Colin and he said, got it. Yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. He also wants to have picture in picture for a Tyler cam down there in the lower left-hand corner. (laughs) Is that what he wants? That's what he wants. (laughs) I could, I could PIP. Okay. I have to set it up, but you could set up anything. If uh, anyone can do anything technology related, it's Tyler. Speaking like of set up, here comes the picture if you want to see that. Okay. All right. What's this picture? So we have a question about transplanting wow. this from Pam Eldred. She's wondering, she is the um, the clean gardening or her husband is the clean gardening person. We had talked about hydrangeas, whether we keep the blooms up or cut them back. Oh, that's right. They were the ones that they, they <sighs> both have their... Uh, Thoughts. Met her a couple times out here. She's yeah. a cool lady. She That's a is. cool picture, a cute picture. I yeah. love it. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Transplanting, though. Good. Oh, <laughs> that boy. looks scary. Is it a black pine or a white? It's a pine of some sort. It, it looks like a pine. It's definitely a pine, but it, yeah. it honestly looks like the uh, one of those long needle Here's pines. That. Okay. The golden. I mean, it's, it definitely has a golden cast to it. I'm okay. not That's sure. Uh, probably a little bit of that I see fall two, winter color. I see three potential problems right there. You have that thing, that, that big brown thing. I think they call it the house. That's <laughs> yeah. the first thing. Uh-huh. And then those two gray things, I think those are uh, really expensive air conditioning units. Mm-hmm. So they're probably going to have to be moved or disconnected to at yeah. least to get a tree spade in there, David. But you think? Yeah, I don't uh, know that. Uh, I don't, you know, we can't really see how far of the distance just behind it certainly it could be hand dug and you know it's not a small job wow and, but what hand digging allows you to do is to be able to get very close on the one mm-hmm. side even if you have to flatten the ball on that one edge looks the tree like it's won't really, right on the foundation really yeah my but, yeah my guess is it's no more than three feet but i think yeah. this is a great example of what frequently happens to folks when they plant something based on the size it is when they purchase it and with the belief that it looks right right now, and as opposed to really having a better understanding of what its potential and what its ultimate growth habit is going to be and allowing for that. Mm-hmm. So uh, consequently, uh, the picture illustrates well what happens when you get one too close to the house. It makes you have to go, well, they should have decided a few years ago to have done it, but it can still be done. Mm-hmm. I don't think it can be done with a tree spade. I think it had to be hand dug. And then, and then Maybe it out. get a, uh, a a track hoe out there or a back hoe and dig around most of it and only have to hand dig the back side of it. And then you've got a piece of machinery to relocate it. You might want to go ahead and dig your know. hole where it's going to. Do they have so. a taproot, most pines? No. Nah, it's more of a gonna have, they, It'll be, be fairly fibrous. So it's, you okay. know, it, but. The thing of it is, you, when you're digging a root ball like that, you don't want to pry against the root ball. Try to to cut cleanly down the sides of the root ball with a sharp spade or shovel, and dig away from it. If you got to do any pry, do it on the soil that surrounds it, not on the root ball itself. You don't want to crack or injure that mm-hmm. root ball. We've got a lot of you know, we've got some moisture overnight. We've got more on the way, so. Our transplanting conditions, really, if you, you if you're prepared mm-hmm. to do it, the windows of opportunity are going to be here, and it's really a good time to do it. But we do have these wet spells that hit in between, so you've got to be kind of ready to move fairly quickly well, when it's time to do it. Well, it's probably got the condenser units probably putting plenty of moisture on that spot already. I oh, would, they're uh, not they're... Get put well during the summer months. Yeah, during the yes. summer months, but not right now. But yeah, yeah, they're not that's not doing anything uh, substantial right now. It's just a matter of getting that out of there so that you can get in there and get it moved out of the way. And mm-hmm. I don't know whether they're if they're only going to move it if if they're just concerned about moving it a few feet out. I have even done things where I, I dug a trench out the direction that I want it to be in and simply uh, get it dug around and pull with a chain or some other the, uh, de- 
some other way to get around it and take a, a truck or a tractor or something and drag it in the trench. That way you don't even have to lift it out of the ground. So that's another consideration. Uh, if you like the general location, which apparently at least at some point you did, you might want to consider just doing that. Dig this trench, slide that root ball where that it's you get it the distance it should be away from the house. Pam did say I want to keep it, but her tidy husband says it's gone with the chainsaw. <laughs> uh oh. <laughs> so we'll be interested to see what ends up happening with this. Well, that'll be a lot easier than moving that big thing. <laughs> I mean that the problem with that tree being so big is that you need such a big root ball, really. Yeah. You know, if you come out here and you look at a white pine we've got on the lot right now, it's like oh, a nine to, so it's huge. a nine to ten footer. Well, the ball sits like 36, 42 inches above the earth. Like, it's massive. You're not even thinking about moving that by yourself or even with two or three people. So as an average homeowner, if you're not willing to get a contractor out there that's got large machinery, like, that's... I mean, <laughs> you're speechless. I'm spe- right it's now. like impossible. I wouldn't want to even start that. Nope. I'm kind of with the clean husband. Cut it to the dirt. Well, you're with the clean husband on the hydrangeas as uh-huh. well. So. But I like his wife so much. She's Listen, so cool. I would try to save it and I would keep those hydrangeas oh, blooms up. Maybe, no, yeah. you wouldn't. I have dug up so many things. Nothing that big. I was about to say, you're a 12 foot pine tree. It's worth a no. try, you know, if you want to get a <laughs> get a good workout in or pay somebody to do it. Uh-huh. All right, let's get to some more questions. Okay. Right. My encore azaleas are showing signs of chlorosis. Okay to add nitrogen fertilizer now. Okay, good question. And I want to know if your chlorosis is the whole plant or if it's more towards the interior because azaleas in general do this. They will shed from the interior and a lot of that. So chlorosis means yellowing typically. Um, And a lot of yellow leaves happen on the inside of your encore azalea. If the outside is still clean and green, then you probably don't have to do much. But if that outside is chlorotic and turning yellow as well, which is a common thing that happens with azaleas, then yes, you can add nitrogen fertilizer, but I would not do that yet. It's a little cool for Mm -hmm. fertilizer to really be activated so i would wait until like kind of the early spring whenever things are just getting ready to pop and burst and then add that nitrogen fertilizer to it and hopefully that'll green them up should go ahead and do a spoma now though right a spoma would be fine any organic fertilizer is fine right now if it is indeed chlorosis uh, that's typically induced by uh the the ph being out of whack Mm -hmm. and and many times if the ph is too high on those things you can't uh, you can't uptake the amount of uh, micronutrients that are in the soil it just simply it can be there and be there uh in abundance but the plant has no access to it if your ph for whatever reason is too high so uh azaleas are acid loving plants they'd like to be down around 5.5 uh optimally to yes. be able to be in the uh have the uh, ph in the range where they can uptake the nutrition that's available and that might be their deficient on nitrogen as well but uh you, you might need to look into something that will you know help them to fight that chlorosis directly and that would be to lower that ph and also give some other micronutrients that will uh, supplement that yeah ph meters are so expensive too aren't they david oh they're about 10 bucks oh man <laughs> so expensive so, yeah. yeah not a lot of people yeah. can afford that so i can just go get you some litmus paper there you remember go. how we used to do it yes today? All right, we're going to loop back around to our pine photo from Pam. She says, Austin, I knew you'd be on his side. (laughs) But she also says they have a tractor. This is going to be fun to follow. Pam, keep us updated. Take photos, videos. Uh We want to see what happens. Uh, If you do get that thing transplanted, you better stake it heavily because that thing's going to catch some wind. You're going to come home. It's going to be cocked at a 45. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> if you don't stake it that is very true i've yep. planted stuff and they've just kind of blown over hey we got a question uh, that we did already answer mm-hmm. previously in the broadcast but i do want to talk about it is it too late to plant bulbs and wildflower seeds no, no. do it it is a great time to do both of them especially wildflower seeds to go ahead and get those going so 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 Let's talk about Sweet Bay Magnolia. While we're on the topic okay. of yellowing leaves, we have a question okay. that asks, should I, should my Sweet Bay Magnolia be yellowing and dropping leaves? Yes, actually. This is a very common thing to happen. Sweet Bay Magnolia for us is sold as a semi-deciduous plant. Okay, so a lot of times it will keep a number of its leaves. It does not keep all of its leaves. If you know magnolias at all, you mm-hmm. know that they shed a lot. And yes. Sweet Bay Magnolia is one that does it over the wintertime, typically. And this so time of year... Would it be more accurate to say it's semi-deciduous or semi-broadly? Semi-evergreen, yeah. Either way, it's tomato-tomato, I guess. But, <laughs> it, uh, yeah, so 
It is going to dry. I noticed on our tree lot yesterday, we've got some sweet magnolias that are shedding some of those underneath leaves, but still have some green leaves atop of them. So it's not uncommon at all for some winters for sweet bay, to mag, sweet bay mags to drop all their leaves. Um, but it's, it's my not favorite uncommon. Wine too. Yeah, it's gorgeous. And, and the, uh, the straight genus, the Magnolia virginiana, they really are decidedly more deciduous than mm -hmm. some of the cultivars that are decidedly less so. So mm -hmm. some of them really hold most of them, except if it's a really severe winter. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, the, the good thing about it is when we're talking about plants is mm -hmm. having a lot of different things to choose from. And that's really where we excel here at Bates Nursery and Garden Center. You can take photographs with your, your cell phone or your tablet and bring those into you and into us. And we'll, show you what we have and you may think well you know it's winter time you don't really have anything to show but that's not true huh. matter of fact we got a full semi load of plants in from monrovia last week so we are really stocked and it doesn't really matter what you're talking about uh with trees shrubs ground cover ornamental grasses fruiting plants uh fruit trees As you can see around the studio here all the tropical plants that uh, Caroline tends to in her area, we've got it all. And it, we, we talked at the beginning of the show about the extensive amount of containers that we have. So it's not too early to start planning on those things. And in addition to having all these plants and expertise, we also carry the complete line of earth mix garden products. So no matter what you're thinking about doing, whether you're uh, digging up and preparing a new planting area or you're going to be uh, putting in some plants and containers in the home and using Proganics Eye, there is an Earthmix products for you, and we have it right here at Bates Nursery and Garden Center, where we are now celebrating our 92nd year of business. Wow. That means I've only got to stay alive eight more years <laughs> to make it to the centennial. So uh -huh. um, I feel hopeful about that. At least today I do anyway. We do too. Uh, and, yes, we do. Anyway, <laughs> but we're very privileged to have gotten to be in Nashville and be in business all these years. And we are, are so appreciative of everything that is uh, the, the really the outpouring of a, uh, loyalty that we have from the uh, middle Tennessee area, although also from people that come from some considerable distance. I also write a weekly newsletter. It's called in the garden with Bates nursery. And if you scroll right down the page here on the website, you'll see it'll come up and the, right there is the newsletter banner. And you can put in your name and your email address. You got to check that box. that says, yes, I agree to be emailed and hit subscribe. And then you'll get the newsletter. We do not share your information with anyone. Mm -mm. And if such time you decide you don't want to receive it anymore, you can unsubscribe. And what I try to do is to uh, keep you apprised of the things you need to be thinking about in the garden. This time of year, perhaps I wind uh uh, a, a little story or two, and this um, week was particularly good. Mm -hmm. by oh, the way. I appreciate mm -hmm. that, yes. and you know, I, I am I'm part of the the the, the good part about uh, having been around for a long time is you you know you, you get to have a lot of experience. As I relate in my article this week, my error rate, uh -huh. however, sometimes is a little high, so I try to uh, uh, not focus on that, but just be aware of it. That applies to your garden as well. So we you know we help try to reduce the error rate that you will have in your gardening experience. So come on out and see us here at Bates Nursery and Garden Center. We're open from 9 a.m. until 2 p.m. today. So we we do shorter hours on Saturday. Come on out and see us today. And it, it's almost all indoors. So unless you're wanting to see big shade trees or big conifers, Everything else is in the mm -hmm. uh, what everybody refers to as the Batesstrom area, our yep. connected structure that goes from the checkout area all the way down in through the perennials and into the annual house, which this time of year houses uh, many of our shrubs and that kind of thing. So you get a even if the weather is not particularly pleasant outside, you're you're out of the wind and any potential precipitation that might occur. So come see us, Bates Nursery and Garden Center. We're conveniently located one mile north. Briley Parkway at exit 19 on White's Creek Pipe, which is just minutes from Rivergate, Opry Mills, Nashville West, downtown Nashville. And I promise you, it is worth the drive no matter where you're coming from. 
Come see us, Bates Nursery and Garden Center, Buing, beautifying Nashville since 1932, Bates Nursery and Garden Center. So thanks for giving us a moment to talk about that, and uh, we'll get back to the questions. Mm -hmm. All right, I got something for y'all. It's okay. exciting. For you, Colin. our viewers, thank yes. you. Oh, If you make it out to the nursery today, today. we have uh. five... Worth of gross stickers. Oh, with the stupidest picture of me. <laughs> this is a vintage 2020 photo uh, of Austin. 2020. In going full Kev mode. Oh, look, look. If you come out to the nursery today, we will get. They're you waterproof. One. They'll stick to your coffee yes, look. cups. Is yeah. Josh is showing. I think up. everybody should know uh -huh. what when it says full Kev mode. Now. Uh -huh. <laughs> Back in, during 2020, on it was at. COVID time of year, and we were just trying to do everything we could to keep up. And we, uh, during times when we were a little deficient on delivery personnel, Austin would be a, a, an auxiliary a delivery guy. But when he was on deliveries, he was known as Kevin. Kevin. <laughs> Kev. So, so uh -huh. that's how we, we would be able to distinguish between if he was here or not, if it was. If Kev was out, then we knew, okay, well, Austin's not here, but uh -huh. Kev's out there. I'd, anyway. I'd be on the line, and someone from the office would be like, they'd be like, Ann or something. She'd be like, Andy, Kev? And I'd be like, oh, God, okay. here we go. I got a delivery. It's delivery uh -huh. time. Mm -hmm. But come out, get you a sticker. There you go. Get What'd you a say? sticker. Tyler, the first five people yeah, out I've that got, mentioned I've got the a show. little more than five, so if, if it happens to be there's more demand, then you know what? You'll get a sticker. Yeah, okay. everyone needs one of those stickers. But, you know, just a little fun on a Good. Saturday. Well, Colin and well, Sam might have a fist fight out there because I think they both want one. Yeah. They're, they're probably going to be one of the first ones okay. here. So, All right, well, enough about me. You know what I want to know? Talk, David, talking about shopping indoors. I want to know what's indoors today. Tyler, what is indoors hit today? the button. What's in room with Caroline? All right, like we already talked about, there are houseplants. It's very tropical in here today. So the houseplant greenhouse is thriving right now. It's mm -hmm. heated and it's a really nice place to shop. So with all that Christmas money, Christmas gift cards you got, yeah. you can liven up your home a little bit. So Josh was asking earlier in the broadcast about what are these in the corner? So behind me and behind David, we have some huge ponytail palms. This is one of my favorite plants um, to recommend for low maintenance. And they're actually used feel like they would want full sun and they do love full sun but i have one in a dark corner of my home that's doing fantastic now i'm not saying that's going to be the best spot to put it but these can grow pretty much anywhere and tyler can you go down to look at the trunk of this look at that wow wow like, a, like an elephant pretty foot. awesome an elephant foot it is uh -huh. also called an elephant foot plant people oh. come in ask everybody that calls all it that. the time <laughs> um, we've never gotten any in this big before it's priced really well for how tall it is. If you've got the space, I mean, go for it. Low water, low maintenance. Mm -hmm. Then beside it, we've got peace lilies. I mean, everyone's had these at one point in their yep. lives if they don't have a couple now. I've got a domino, which is just a variegated leaf uh, spathophyllum that I love. And then in between, we've got the bronze bay dracaena. So it's got like a uh, bright green on the outside, yellow in the inside. It's a really, really cool looking Dracaena. We actually hadn't gotten these in before um, mm. until this year. And then down in front, down I mean, front. Pothos. Everyone's seen that running across their grandma's oh, kitchen nice. cabinets. Hey, Classic houseplant. Again, we're talking low maintenance, easy to care for, beginner friendly houseplants today. This is a great one. And on the side beside Josh and Austin is rubber tree, Ficus yep. elastica. So it's a dark leaf ficus. It's really, really low maintenance as far as ficus goes, and it can handle lower light than I would say your fiddle leaf fig. My ants can't Way move them. Way easier. And ants can't move them. That's nope. right, Josh. <laughs> and then down in front, we've got Song of India Dracaena. It's a really cool um, smaller Dracaena than the one that is right behind me, the Bronze Bay. Really neat. It grows crazy. It kind of will spiral, twist, grow over the pot, grow up. When they get mature, they look really, really stunning. <laughs> so yeah, we went a little simple today, which I like. But simple but classy. The oxygen in here is just probably so nice right Clean. now. Yeah. Clean I haven't, I haven't oxygen. been gasping for air at all. Yeah, it's all those <laughs> houseplants. No, I mean, great. there's so many good things about putting houseplants in your home. Cleaning Pony your oxygen. You got friends. Palm. Josh is definitely going to take one of these home today, mm -hmm. right? Uh -uh. No, uh -uh. we've got smaller ones as well. Okay. 
Okay. But it's going to be a long time before they get that big. They grow mm-hmm. fairly slow. So, Before fun fact you, about mine, I was talking about how they're low maintenance mm-hmm. earlier in the broadcast. I have a couple, but one of them I have in a dark corner right now. It gets no sun. I hardly water it in the winter, and it actually grows a little bit, surprisingly, and doesn't grow all weird. And then in the spring, I put it outside in full sun immediately. It is the only plant that I can take from dark to light without those leaves getting burned or damaged. It and you actually have pottery right big enough to put that rascal in if oh, you don't like the beautiful do. decorative plastic one that comes with it. Yeah, so. those lovely nursery pots. Mm-hmm. We've got plenty of pots. Wow. Do. All right, let's go ahead and get to some more questions. Why are all my Arizona cypress turning brown and dying? Uh-oh. <laughs> dying? Well, that's weird. I mean, Arizona cypress certainly sheds like all evergreens do from the interior of the plant, and they're doing that right now. But dying is a different scenario. Um, Arizona cypress took it on the chin last year, though, not going to lie. Like, a lot of them didn't necessarily die, but they really got injured Burn. from that freeze, okay? Um, and the only other thing I can think of is that Arizona cypress really likes it on the dry side. So if you have a wet spot at all, Arizona cypress is not going to like you in that scenario. So if it's actually dying, um, that might be the case. I want to see some pictures, though, just to confirm that it's actually okay on that. If it's okay on the outermost part, then stick with it. This spring, it's going to have a flush, and it's going to cover up all that kind of ugly, hopefully, um, from last year's freeze. So cover up that maybe way. stick with it. I don't know. Yeah, there are a few things, you know, whether it's conifers or broadleaf, either one, when they when they do interior mm-hmm. yellowing of the foliage, it's a common uh, misconception that the people interpret that as there being something wrong with it or that yeah. it's dying. And it's not. It's just the way the plant deals with foliage that's not contributing to right. photosynthesis. It just drops those off. And then, as Austin just said, that new flush of growth comes out in the spring, and then it's all back thick and full again. Mm-hmm. And, bigger. and uh, uh, Tyler, if they wanted to send pictures so Austin could take a look, where would they send those? Well, uh, if I could talk. Okay, you had the mic button. Yeah. Uh, then you, you just send them to that email right there. Mm-hmm. Gardeninginsideout at gmail.com. There you go. Yep. Cool. Send them. I want to send them it. on. And I will say it's a little bit easier on Tyler if you send them ahead of time, although yep. we can sometimes get them up mid broadcast. But if you think ahead of time, I want them to take a look at these photos and I want them to bring them up on the TV. Yes. Send your send your success stories too, not just your sick babies. Yeah, things I mean, that you're proud of. Please. Yeah. Uh, we want to see that. all of it. We yes. want to see beauty. Definitely yes, do. by the Friday before the broadcast. Mm-hmm. Okay. If not, we can always wait for the next week. All right. How can I keep milkweed from getting ravaged by aphids in the spring? I would say you mm. can't. Good luck. <laughs> aphids love milkweed. It's, and it's kind of what they do. <laughs> it's yeah. particularly that oleander aphid. So it's those real bright yellow aphids. They're kind of pretty, though. They are kind of pretty. And they don't do a terrible amount of damage to milkweed whatsoever, honestly. Honestly, leaving some of those aphids, y'all, is somewhat, a lot of times, beneficial for your garden. Because it brings in ladybugs yep. and all those other insects that like yep. to eat aphids. Aphids are like the little little skittles of the of the. Or d'oeuvres, as they were. I don't know why I went Skittles. Because they're sweet. They're sweet and tasty and bright and beautiful. Skittles. But then aphids come in and just ravage them. And that's kind of what we want. We want a good garden, a balance of bad bugs, good bugs. And if the bad bug is not doing all that much to your plant or hurting it all that much, then kind of let them be. And like I said, they will Mm -hmm. a lot of times get get taken care of without you having to do anything. Mm -hmm. Now, if you really hate it, Y'all take your fingers and just run it along the stem and just Oops. smash and smush Ugh. all those aphids. Mine was it's a gooey, yucky this finger. Summer. Yeah, mm-hmm. it, that sounds pretty yuck to me. Yeah. But you can do it. You can also I mean, just spray them off with, you know, some light you pressure could, water. But you got to buy that. Oh, just water. Just yeah. <laughs> those little, little rascals cling on, though. They do. <laughs> they're, I mean, <laughs> they hold on tight, hold don't on, they, Dad? Yeah, yeah okay. They're I think I have a picture hurricane. of mine from last year. I mean, mine was covered, they were just on top of each other. Kind of gross, but also a little bit cool looking. Yeah. Right. We're going to talk about one plant that I love and that I hate at the same time because I planted a type that I shouldn't have planted. Does passion flower vine leaf out from last year's growth or start from the ground? In my case, it starts growing and it never stops. It never loses its leaves. It just grows through the winter. It grows through the spring and summer and it takes over. It grows from the ground. The growing machine. Growing machine. Now, the native variety can die back to the ground and come back from there, but they are really, really hardy plants. I know Tyler's had one for quite a while as well. Yeah, that's Passiflora incarnata is the one that it, it produces fruit and I've had it for several years. 
the original plant that I planted did eventually die and not come back, but don't worry because it produces enough offspring to last you for the rest of the decade. A lifetime. They just oh. show up in spots that you were so randomly not expecting. They shoot off but they're runners really, and grow everywhere. They're really easy to pull up when they're first coming up. <laughs> like, oh, you know, they, they are for they're me. They're easy to pull up, but they keep going. Then it <laughs> makes them go further. But it, it doesn't... And then they grow into your hydrangeas and they grow up your house. Mm -hmm. Someone's biased. And then the trees. Somebody had a bad time, didn't they? I planted it in the wrong spot. Oh. I planted it in one of my garden beds right next to my house when I was... This was years ago, and I was just experimenting, and I will never get rid of that plant. The thing is, it, it tempts you with its beauty. There's Mine the hasn't flower. bloomed in about five years. What? It's what? only that's, the leaves. That's it's Everything else in that bed blooms. My hydrangeas, all of my grasses. That does not sound like echinacea. our mm. native passion. I said flower. it was not. Yeah. It is not the native. Oh, well, the native is it great. It bloomed the first Don't let Caroline's years. bias sway you <laughs> But I'm just away saying, it. It make sure you know what you're planting and where you want to plant it. Do mm -hmm. your research. Sounds like wisteria with me years yeah. ago. Yeah. That's so, right. Uh, did you get and rid of it? Still with me. <laughs> no. Wisteria no. trauma. Yeah, no, you never I sold the house. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> you sold the house to get away from it. It was as good a reason as any. Yep. All right. <laughs> we got a question from Miriam. Good morning, Miriam. We already hey, Miriam. Good morning, but here's another. We love you. Mm -hmm. What is the best plan to keep Bermuda out of beds ahead of the coming growing season? <laughs> oh, oh, the grass. Oh, good luck. <laughs> Miriam, you give us the hardest <laughs> questions. That's that's so hard. God, Bermuda. What would you say, though? I mean, I'm just always pulling it. That's yeah, I mean, you I always do. pull it. I mean, she wants something better than that, I'm assuming. I mean, I guess like some sort of... The only thing I can think of is like a, a metal like barrier that you could like drive into the earth. And even Ten still, feet. it's going to yeah. hop over it. Like, Good string trimmer or, skills. Or go yeah. under. I have it going under my sidewalk. Exactly. Yeah. Like it, It's yeah. relentless. Yep. It's like bamboo. Yeah. It's like... I don't... I don't... Miriam... I love you, but I'm sorry. <laughs> you got Bermuda, girl. Good. Austin awesome gives up do. so easily. I actually got a tiller <laughs> attachment for my weed eater, yep. and I'm going scorched earth. Yeah, buddy. Because yeah, that's good luck. That's but it what comes you have right to back. Do to... How many times are you gonna do it, Tyler? Though? Every time, like, every the grass? week. Yeah. Not, I mean, no, yeah. right now when it's all dormant, I can rip out most of the rhizomes, and then when they uh -huh. yes, inevitably do pop up in their the, own special the way. The operative uh -huh. word uh -huh. being I can keep pulling most of most of most of. It's impossible to. Get it out of there. You the leave just one. Season. It's mm -hmm. coming back. Even a little one. Baby one. A tiny root. The yes. same thing with passion flower. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. My crepe myrtles have really thin trunks. How do you bulk them up? Huh. Well, first off. Get them on a weight program. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> first. <laughs> protein. Yeah, protein. You need uh, Nutrafast. The first thing is is time, okay? So, you know, plants just, it takes time for them to swell. I don't know why the trunks are really thin, unless it's in a very shady spot. I have noticed this with crepe myrtles in the mm -hmm. shade. They will really shoot tall, mm -hmm. and their stems will stay thin um, because of the amount of sunlight and, that they're not getting. So if it's in a shady spot, that may be what's going on. You can always top prune the crepe myrtle, you know, to kind of keep them a little shorter, and that will will swell out their trunks a little bit, but honestly, it's a it's a waiting game, really. I mean, my it just red takes rockers time. naturally uh, has thin stems. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just it, it's not like yeah. a natchez that you're going to turn into a tree. It also yeah. kind of yeah. depends on how many stems you decide right. to keep. Okay, mm -hmm. so if right. you just get it down to three to five main stems or so, the I instead of yeah. having twenty, if you have twenty stems, yeah. all those stems are going to be much thinner. So if you go ahead and you know thin that out to about three to five main canes, then you can see some swellage. Some swellage. Some swellage. That's not a word. <laughs> you just made up a word, Austin. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Swellage. That's cool. Swellage. It works. Y'all get yeah. it. It does. That's we like understood. It's about really swole. nice. It's swole. Swole. Uh huh. It gets swole. Yeah. <sighs> Speaking of swole, <laughs> the clock is swollen <laughs> to eight yeah. fifty nine. Take us out, David Bates. <laughs> well, you know, it's been a great fact, fun, frivolity. <laughs> And, yeah. you know, a lot of green information. Garden, yeah, and, yeah we, we tried to put it all out there this week, like every week. So we thank you for turning in once again. And thank you for the very capable individuals we have around us. Josh, Caroline, Austin, Tyler. And David. Thank you all. Well, you know, I try to You're make around too. my little mm -hmm. contribution. That's right. A little bit. So, all right. Anyway. See you next week, folks. Uh -huh. We'll be here from the Green Room Studios at Bates Nursery and Garden Center for Gardening Inside Out.
Come get your stickers. Yes. Stickers. (laughs) 